So February is LGBT History Month in the UK, and the sisters also on February the 6th celebrate Old Queen's Day, a celebration of older LGBT, etc. people. So today I'm talking to Sir Jane General, one of our longest serving henches, captain of our guard, and general all around nice person. We're both about the same age, but we were brought up in very different places. So I would like to hear about life in the 80s and 90s as a lesbian in Edinburgh. So Jane, have you always been in Edinburgh? About 90% of my life, yes. I've worked down south um, and I've visited um, you know, other parts of Scotland, but about 90% of my life has been in Edinburgh, born and brought up here. So when the sisters blessed your civil partnership with Mary, one thing that you were made to promise was that you would take actually stop to take advantage of all the political work that you've been doing. So how long have you been involved in politics? Because as far as I can see, it's forever. Just about. Um, I, I came out. Um, I realised I was a lesbian when I was about 16. And uh, um, on spotting a, a sign up in the vegan um, Seeds Cafe, which not far from the university, and sat there and memorised it because I was with my parents. I didn't want to ask for a pen or anything. I went along there, and they pointed me at um, Lavender Menace, and Lavender Menace pointed me at the... Um, Sigrid Nilsson Lavender Menace pointed me at the youth group, and so, I went on to that. And um, I would say that Edinburgh, the, the Elgium, Edinburgh Lothian's Lesbian Gay Youth Movement, was not terribly political, but tried to be. We did talk about things, we did aim to talk about things besides our parents, so not that Ben tended to come back to that. And it was, in my view, it was political in that um, I think one of the strongest political actions that LGBT people can take is to be is to be out, to not um, I think that the simple action of saying, you know, that I'm I'm a lesbian, I exist, you know, and you know, deal with it by being out means that um, does eventually change the world one drop of um, one drop at a time it's very it's very hard to convince people that um you know lgbt people's awful inchoate mass out to corrupt your children when you know there they are just on the street buying a pint of milk yep so lavender menace was the bookshop right mm. It was Lavender Menace was the bookshop. It was in the basement just below the Scottish C and D office. And I recall being extremely nervous the first I went there because my dad was extremely active in C and D. And I kept thinking, what if someone who knows my dad sees me going downstairs? You think these things when you're 17. Um, the group was founded by three of the bookshop volunteers who, who um, were all under 20 and all working on Saturdays in the bookshop and who said there, there ought to be a youth movement and decided, and in the way of things, just decided they would meet to put, put, you know, put up signs. And shortly afterwards, there was a group of um, queer teenagers meeting in the basement at the Gay Centre. Not long after you would have left school would have been when Section 28, Section 2A came in. Yes. I went on marches in London I went with with down to London to, to meet it. To, we met a friend and we went to get and we he lived in London and we went together on the march. That at that time, um, ten Downing Street didn't have gates. What they did was put up very light um, barriers, to indicate that if you were marching down Whitehall, you you continued down Whitehall. You did not turn into Downing Street. And the first group at the top of the at the start of the march decided to push the barriers aside to go down Downing Street and tell the Prime Minister what we thought. And by the time I and Andrew came along, um, there was a mass of policemen blocking the way, and Andrew and I hung on to each other and managed not to get shoved over, and did not get to walk down Downing Street. But I suspect that everyone who did probably got arrested, which wouldn't be my idea of a fun away day on Saturday night. I recall very vividly being in that crowd, face to face with a policeman who kept saying, very young policeman who kept saying, back, you know, back off. And me saying, you, you, you're shoving us. We can't actually move. So proto kettling. Yes, they hadn't. It had not occurred to them at that point. I think their idea at that point was to keep us moving, 
But what struck me also was that they, it seemed to be symptomatic of London organisations at the time that they heard there was going to be a gay thing happening and they thought, well, it'll be a few hundred people. And it was always about 30,000. And they simply were not set up for tens of thousands. And London Underground, every year, a pride, and in in, in, were warned, you know, we're, pride is happening, it's, right, the march will terminate and then everyone will be heading the festival. You need to make sure that you know, the underground can cope. And every year they, they would just completely ignore it and the underground would crash. You know, it was, it was like, this year, can you please remember, there's going to be 30,000 people trying to get from point A to point B at more or less the same time. Oh no, it'll be just a few hundred, won't it? <laughs> so did you go to that demo off your own back or was it part of an organised trip? I don't remember at this point. I remember there were two or three organised trips. Um, Alan Joy organised several buses down, um, and I went down using the overnight, um, it was an incredibly cheap overnight bus, £10 return ticket, that a lot of queer people used. Um, and I do, not, I do not remember that particular march down Whitehall, whether I'd gone, I, whether I'd gone with the group or whether I was there off my own bat. There was so much happening at the time, and we were we were all so angry. I mean, it was backlash against something that wasn't even happening. Margaret Thatcher was saying people are telling children it's okay to be gay, and none of us have been told it was okay to be gay. There's been this deafening silence, and apparently, even a slight crack in that deafening silence was just like, oh no 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 no, we can't have any of that. You know, shut up. Yeah. So, but you were active in various groups by that time, weren't you? Yes, I um, was editor of Lesbian Scotland for three years, um, which meant, and a member of SHRG during that time. Um, I was a director of Calusa Limited, um, the, the company that produced Gay Scotland. And the, I was also, I can't remember whether I was an active member of Lark in the Park, but I remember I was there in one of the first meetings it happened after when we were discussing what do we do now, Section 28 has passed. And um, Alan Joyce was like, let's have, let's have a big party in the in Princess Street Gardens and make them all see us, which was very <laughs> Alan Joy, really. Um, I belong to um, a feminist group that met at Edinburgh University that seemed to be about 50% lesbians. And the, I didn't really count, you know, just my, just my estimation. Um, I think, though, I was active politically. I went to, we went, there was, in 1987, just before um, the Section 28 thing started, there was actually a conference about how, you know, we should have a Lesbian and Gay Rights Act in London. And I went to that, um, and we were all, we were all very hopeful. And then nothing, and then Section 28 happened. I think, I, I think when, when Section 28 became law, I actually went through a period of really not being political, just because it seemed to me, well, we tried and we failed. You know, we really tried incredibly hard. And I'd seen more, I'd been on more and large activist marches in that time than ever before. And it had just, none of it had actually worked. The Pink Paper did a front page banner, there's a parody of the, the poem, um, the day our right, they, they called it the day our rights died. And it did feel like that. You know, we 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 tried, we pushed, we we gone on thirty thousand strong marches, um, and we we tried everything, and nothing had worked. They still just thought, right, you know, gay people bad, should keep them at schools. I didn't become political, I think, again until um, probably not until the stop until the the scrap section campaign started. Um, in 1998, um, 1998, I remember we, we were working on it because the Scottish Parliament was due to open. Um, the course network had just barely been founded. And that was good. That was the next big push um, to get the, the to have that, that be one of the first things the Scottish Parliament did. Yep, so that would have made it 99, because I remember hmm. that perception demonstrations being among the first things I did as a sister. Yeah. We did, um, Brian Souter had a free post address. He said he said that people should send him information about Section 28. And um, 
I had a friend who was a night nurse at the time, and she spent a lot of the night shifts um, filling in, you know, you know, filling in, filling envelopes with stuff. You know, old telephone directories, scrap paper, writing the, the people's address and dropping in the post, um, and then posting at the end of a shift. I think we all did something of the sort. Just, uh, we were just, you know, Brian sort of just left an open goal there. Yeah, apparently somebody sent a bedstead. What a shame. <laughs> because he, he basically forgot to check the box that put an upper limit on what could be sent. Mm-hmm. Oops. Yes, what a shame. Yeah, yeah no, I think the people, the excuse for perhaps like telephone directories was that Brian Suter wanted to know about gay people in Scotland, and each telephone directory contained one in ten gay people, so Brian Suter could spend his time calling them all up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those particular demonstrations, there was there was that, and there were the, around the same time the demonstrations when the Bank of Scotland got into bed with Pat Robertson. Yes. Yes, I think that was, I, I think at the time I was actually down in London, I was working down south. I remember I was actually in Edinburgh the day the Scottish Parliament opened, um, so I, I, miss, I missed that. But I do recall the anti, you know, the, the, the Bank of Scotland and Pat, Pat Robertson um, demos as well. Yeah, um, and the fact that they eventually, they eventually had to back off. Um, which Pat Robinson blamed on um, the forces of darkness being particularly active in Scotland. You won't believe how strong the homosexuals are in Scotland. Yes. <laughs> yes, when I came back to Scotland properly, I left um, the working down south, came back, was working in Fife, and was active in the campaign for civil partnership and in the campaign uh, for the... Um, the gender, you know, gender Recognition Act, and we were also col- collecting data for what would eventually become um, the Hate Crimes um, Act, um, which didn't get passed until uh, much later on. So Patrick Harvey eventually brought in a private members bill after years and years and years of delay, because I remember I, I remember collating data for it in 2002, and Patrick Harvey's private members bill was 2008. So it was a, it was a while. But in 2000, when I came back in 2001, there was a really different feeling about um, you know, Section 28 got scrapped. The Scottish Parliament was right there, and you could talk to them. And there was a real feeling, you know, we could now we could get things done. You used to work for the Equality Network for a while. I did. I was a trustee there for a couple of years, and I had to quit being a trustee when I got a paid job there. I was information officer from 2004 to 2012. So what was it like being pretty much in the middle of things at that time? It became very weird because I, I used to, I, I started, I, I, you know, there's always something I've been involved in, but suddenly I would know so much about so much that somebody would ask me a question and I would start giving them a three-paragraph answer. And I recall when, when Mario and I went, to get civilly partnered, one of the requirements of a partnership is that the, the registrar, you, you meet before, a, few, a few weeks before, and the registrar gives you a little rundown how, what civil partnership means and how it's a legal relationship um, and blah, 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 blah. I knew exactly what he was going to say because I had read it over several times and I'd written explanations of it and why it has to be there. And I literally had to sit on my hands to avoid me myself saying anything to him. Um, he'd, um, we were discussing marriage and the possibility of converting civil parts to marriage, and I started explaining to him the way it was going to work was. And he, he looked at me and was like, "I'm the registrar." He, he, he was more or less like, "I'm the registrar. I'm supposed to tell you this." <laughs> and I shut up because, I, well, yes, I could tell you that I actually wrote the instruction leaflet from which you got your information at civil partnership and just been telling me, but you've got a point. You know, the, the stuff you've legally got to tell me, and I'm not helping by telling you that I know it already because I wrote something. <laughs> um, no, I, I think it's, I, 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 fa- I found that actually being in on how being, being able to watch right close up how legislation gets passed and how you can then introduce legislation to people who will be affected by it 
I wrote with, with, with the information officer Stonewall, I wrote the hate crimes booklet for how you, how you can report hate crime to all the police force in Scotland. And it was amazing to do this because I started collating evidence of hate crime back in 2002. And then there were various committee meetings and then the Labour government said, oh, they do it at some point and then they never did. And then the SNP government said, oh, yes, it's very important, it must do it at some point. And then they never did. And eventually Patrick Harvey drew a, load, uh, you know, a good number in the private members bills and he did it. And it finally got through. But, um, and I was in on discussions about how to make civil partnership exactly identical to marriage in both Scotland and England, and how that was going to impact people who had never had any legal recognition of the relationship before. But of course, what civil partnership also brought in was the right of same-sex couples to be to be, by, to be officially recognised as by the ins. Whereas before yep. that, a mixed-sex couple living together will be recognised officially in all sorts of ways, starting with the you know, starting with the dole office. Yeah, and, and, and going on from there. But a, a same-sex couple living together were invisible under the law until civil partnership became law. And the moment civil partnership became law, by the ins, same-sex by the ins became an officially recognised relationship. So part of the job was was writing up how, how this is going to affect you, even if you didn't want to have a civil partnership. I found that, I, I, uh, and, and knowing these things are going to happen, knowing how these things are going to affect people and reading reading legislation, understanding it. And listening to Tim Hopkins explain legislation is an education itself because Tim was incredibly good at reading in through all the bones of it and talking out exactly how he thought this is going to impact people. And he, he could occasionally be wrong, but it was usually because he hadn't actually thought through the full implications of um, well, Tim, like a lot of older gay men, had never thought properly thought through that women can get pregnant. And I know that the only woman who got pregnant when she was at the Boston Network um, was found that she had a whole conversation with Tim about why she would be needing to take say, unpaid leave without Tim ever mentioning the word pregnancy. <laughs> it was one of those... Um, I think from older gay men I know, they, 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 this was an area they just always thought, I never have to think about this. Um, presumably trans men were completely off their radar at this point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, though, mind you, I, I, I did notice that when I had a conversation with the Edinburgh Abortion Rights Group about how we, we ought to make language around abortion access gender neutral. Um, but, and, uh, and there was sort of brief pause while they all digested that. At least that one person was about, I swear, was about to say something about trans women don't need um, don't need to have abortions. And I point out trans men sometimes do. Anybody who can get pregnant may need an abortion. Trans men can get pregnant, therefore they might need an abortion. And we are an abortion rights group, therefore we offer abortions for everybody if they want them. And I, I guess I can say it took about it took about five minutes. Whereas I can imagine a similar conversation 15 years earlier um, with a group of older gay men might have taken a lot longer. What was the social life like back then? Was there any? Oh, yes, it just, I wasn't terribly, I, 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 I have always hated discos. I used to think I just hated discos because when I was at, you know, when I, when I was at school and being performed to the heterosexual because I didn't, I didn't really like, I didn't really like boys. And then I actually went to gay discos and realised, no, I just plain didn't like discos. I don't handle loud music very well. I don't handle like, dark space and flashing lights very well. And um, while well, it was fun going to the Laughing Duck disco just for the sake of being with, you know, being with friends, in general, when the lesbian disco started up, I generally used to be the one, um, you know, volunteering to babysit the lesbian mother who wanted to go to the disco. It did mean I got to hear all the good gossip afterwards, um, when Leslie mother came home and was like, you know, let me offer you a cup of tea, we go home and let me tell you what happened. So I got here about the time one lesbian got mad, another lesbian for going out with a girl and went at one lesbian with a bath bottle and security guards had to separate them. And I happened to know all the lesbians. I said, did that really happen? Yes. <laughs> yeah. they, um, 
I, I have to say, I think Edinburgh lesbians tended to be a lot more dirty looks and, um, you know, I work and cutting other lesbians' bed in a metaphorical rather than the physical sense. But uh, that, that was the only time I ever remember hearing about something actually violent happening on lesbian discos. Uh, yeah. But uh, the Edinburgh folk are generally known for being poisonously polite to people they don't like. And I have to say, I think Edinburgh lesbians are perfectly good at this too. <laughs>